Everyone who has ears should pay attention. Those words bring back memories of my childhood when my mind and my body were going 50 different directions at once and my mom would have to say to me, pay attention, I'm talking to you. And mere scolding would go in one ear and out the other. A reasoned plea for better behavior might get better traction, but a story? A story would get my attention every time because stories have depths to plumb that last for a lifetime. Too often we're taught that stories are just stories, that they don't affect our lives. For instance, we tell children not to be upset because it's not real when Bambi's mother gets shot. But it is real, and it's real in more than the sense of being real in that secondary world. Understanding these stories offers a very real route to experiencing what both the pain and joy are all about. If we say stories aren't true, we rob them of their integrity and ourselves of the opportunity to know the depths of human experience in this world. The truth is that sometimes we become so numbed inured of hard reality itself, that it takes a story to help us feel again, to break up, as novelist Kafka called it, the sea frozen inside us. And the world around us is in many ways numbed to the idea of religion, frozen in a childhood understanding of a vengeful distant God or a fatalist worldview that says what they do doesn't make a difference. A farmer, ragged and barefoot, was standing on the steps of his raggedy shack. A stranger stopped for a drink of water and he asked, how is your cotton coming along? Farmer said, ain't got any. Stranger, did you plant any? Farmer, nope, afraid of boll weevils. Stranger, well, how is your corn? Farmer, didn't plant any, afraid there would be no rain. Stranger, well, how are your potatoes? Farmer, ain't got any, scared of potato bugs. Stranger, really? What did you plant? Farmer, nothing. I just played it safe. So you have to ask, how safe is it? not to have any crops at all. Because though most of us are not farmers, we plant every day. We plant ideas in the minds of children if we are parents and teachers. We plant hope if we are social workers or pastors or mental health workers or personal trainers. We plant skills and systems if we are entrepreneurs or engineers or administrators. Well, you get the picture. We're all planters of one kind or another, and what we plant is important. But lest we get all technical and specific about what that looks like, Jesus shows us the reality of planting via his use of parables, of stories, and begins with seven of them in this 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Why stories? Because they tell us something deep. Now, it won't surprise any of us watching today that Time magazine discovered that the most significant person who ever lived, numero uno, in all of human history is Jesus. And when they tackled that question, they used a computer to aggregate millions of traces of opinions, the way Google ranks top web pages. The top results were not terribly surprising. Number two to Jesus' number one was Napoleon, three, Muhammad, four, William Shakespeare, five, Abraham Lincoln. And of course, all those are real people. Have you ever wondered who might be the most influential, most 100 most influential people who never lived? People who never took a breath 
except in the pages of fiction? Well, Time produced a book about those folks as well. Now, some of them are even better known to us than historical figures. Sherlock Holmes, Wonder Woman, Ebenezer Scrooge, Betty Crocker, Don Quixote, Rosie the Riveter, Captain Ahab, Mary Poppins, Indiana Jones, Romeo and Juliet. All influential, all very significant, but none of them actually had a life. They only got a fictional life because someone created them. Fiction. You know their impact. Without such figures, we couldn't speak of a man having an Oedipus complex or the Peter Pan syndrome. We couldn't describe women as Cinderella or Madame Bovary. We couldn't say we were afraid of government being Big Brother or science producing Dr. Frankenstein's monster. Our lives are much richer because of these people who never lived in stories that never really happened. And the Bible contains quite a few of those characters as well. The prodigal son comes to mind. But the sower is one of those fictional characters created by Jesus and one of the most significant figures from his wide-ranging collection of parables. So in the setting for our parable, Jesus faces such a crowd of admirers by the Sea of Galilee that he has to teach from a boat while the people stand on the beach. Listen, says Jesus, a sower went out to sow. And we can visualize the sower in the field. And as we do so, our imaginations are sparked. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path and the birds came and ate them up. Notice that the sower is just tossing seed, not digging holes and then covering the seeds with dirt. And when some seeds hit the path and are gobbled up by birds, the sower just keeps on sowing. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, says Jesus, where they did not have much soil and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. The sower, though, doesn't seem to care where the seed goes, throwing it on completely inhospitable rocky ground. Not surprisingly, those seeds scorch and die. But the sower keeps moving along, and Jesus says that other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seed fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone who has ears listen or pay attention. <coughs> Finally, when we see a few of those seeds hit, the, hit good soil, voila, we discover that they bring forth grain in enormous quantities. So what strikes us immediately about the character of this sower? We might say that he seems a bit careless, mightn't we? I mean, he just keeps on sowing his seed, believing that growth will come. So what does the sower tell us about Jesus? This influential person who never lived has something to teach us about the most significant person who ever lived. Jesus is not cautious about where he preaches and on whom he invests his time. Jesus simply keeps sowing the word of the kingdom of God, even though it lands on religious people who wonder if he is possessed, on disciples who struggle to understand him, and at least on one young rich man who cannot part with his possessions in order to follow Jesus. The sower keeps sowing. And Jesus keeps spreading the word. As followers of Jesus, we should be doing mission and ministry in the very same way. Perhaps that same careless abandon should characterize the church's ministry, speaking gracious words without carefully calculating the potential for success. 
So that means welcoming others as Jesus has welcomed us and preaching a message of unconditional love and unlimited grace. After all, Jesus calls us to be faithful to him and to the kingdom of God, not to be successful in some worldly sense. But there's even a deeper level to this parable. Because when Jesus explains the meaning of the story to his disciples, the focus suddenly shifts from the sower to the soil. At that point, you could even call it the parable of the four kinds of soil. And when the emphasis is on the soil, the message, of course, is that we should all be the good soil. People who hear the word of the kingdom of God and understand it. Because Jesus promises to the person who does so that they will bear fruit and yields. I love that. A hundredfold. Some 60, some 30. And we come to realize that the word of God that is planted is a whole lot more than words. It's the word made flesh. It's the experiences of God that every single one of us experience. And so this story, this parable, is for today and for always. So what did you hear when you listened to the story? Where are you in this particular parable? And then, when have you felt all of those responses to God's word? Because, friends, none of us is good soil all of the time. And there's never just one response that is true for once and for all. God's word is dynamic, not static. And the way that we see and experience God changes as we go through life. But there are those wonderful times when everything comes together and our soil is ready to receive God's word. Where are you today? I love the way Robert Hulse connects the dots for us from a college student perspective, and he writes, every fall, new students come to Concordia University. The admissions department has carefully screened their applications. They are admitted because they can all succeed they all have the ability to learn and to graduate. They are good people and good students. But I know from history that some will be distracted. Extraneous things will gobble up their time and talents. Perhaps the path of their life has been hard and they lack self-confidence. Maybe anger at their parents chews them up. They may carry a self-destructive grudge against former friends. Anger at themselves may gnaw away at their ability to succeed. A variety of things like vultures gobble up their ability for educational growth, and they soon drop out or flunk out. Other students start well. They get to class on time. They even sit in the front row. They love to ask questions. They engage in class discussions, and they're eager to share their own opinions. But their discipline is rocky. They have a hard time with time management. They don't plan usage of their time in order to start writing their papers on time. They socialize well, but they can't seem to find time to read their assignments. And when the pressures get hot, they start to wilt. When it's time for an oral presentation or a midterm test or final, the heat is too much and they drop out or flunk out. Some students make bad decisions about relationships. They get in with a seedy, weedy crowd. There are a lot of places to have fun in a big city. City life crowds with sporting events, theaters, museums, nightclubs, restaurants, bowling alleys, and arcades. It's a great learning environment if one makes good decisions about sound time management. But some students' academic life begins to choke with too much time in too many places, with too many non-academic activities. Even special academic tools can choke proper academic growth. 
Concordia University St. Paul's is a laptop campus, which means a part of tuition, as a part of tuition, every student gets a laptop computer. It's a marvelous educational tool when used properly, but it strangles academic life if it is used too much to play games, to send personal emails, or for random searches on the internet. When academic demands, ability and interest are choked off, students will drop out or fail. The majority of new students, however, will grow and mature. They will study and learn. They will experience the goals of our mission statement, which calls the faculty and staff to prepare students for thoughtful and informed living, for dedicated service to God and humanity, and for enlightened care of all of God's creation, all in the context of the Christian gospel. The new students' faith in God and knowledge in life will germinate and grow, and there will be a great harvest. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the good news is that we can simply start connecting the dots wherever we find ourselves in our faith journey right now. And what is it that Jesus commands us to do as we get started? In a word, listen. Or if you prefer two words, pay attention. That's what Jesus says at the beginning of his explanation of the parable. And it's certainly something that we can do as active rather than passive disciples. Listen to the story of the sower and learn that Jesus is incredibly generous in the way that he shares the word of the kingdom with all the people of the world. Listen and learn that God's word is incredibly fruitful and that a great harvest is guaranteed. Listen and learn that the coming of the kingdom of God isn't something that we can control, though we can actively participate. And while we might be reluctant to be wasteful and overly extravagant because it goes against our somewhat frugal nature, the sower reveals to us that Jesus is such a wasteful role model spreading the word of God's kingdom with wild abandon. Our job is to trust what he is doing and to share that message with joy and generosity as we deeply listen to the voices all around us crying to be heard by those of us who love God. If we do, we will be feeling the influence of a person who never lived, the sower, will also be following a savior who really lived and died and then rose to be with us forever. Amen. <laughs>